First at five, a Southtown business owner says she is devastated, but focused on the future. It took some 30 units and around 100 firefighters to battle a two alarm raging fire at a building on South Flores this morning. That fire started between two buildings and then spread. After more than two hours, fire crews got those flames under control. As for what caused the fire right now, it is unclear. Devin Clark live on the scene with a look at the damage and what's next for those who worked there. Well, Ursula, Steve, this area is still closed off at this hour. You can see behind me the building that was on fire pretty much reduced to a shell. There's not much left to it. Firefighters say that it's likely going to have to be demolished. What can't be destroyed, though, is the drive of the people who worked inside. And this fire is even going to fuel us to be better. Magali Chocano says when fire destroyed the building that Sweb, her web and app development company, has been housed in for the past three years, she had no choice but to look on the bright side. The minute that I saw the flames come out of my building, you know, outside of the devastation, I thought, what am I supposed to learn from this? It was around 10 this morning when Sweb web developer Jorge Mata noticed something was wrong. Hey, everyone's thrilled because it's Friday um, and then so suddenly we start getting this smell like someone lit a match. Moments later, Mata says the situation intensified. Before we knew it, there's a, a tall window in our that was in our building where we started seeing just orange glowing coming out. Mata ran outside and noticed the fire spreading from an alleyway that sits between the sweat building and another. He called 911 and jumped into action as help was en route. Immediately just ran and evacuated the building and we wanted to evacuate next door as well, make sure everybody was safe. Fortunately, no one was injured, and for the SWEB team, not even spirits were singed. With work canceled for the day, they met for food and drinks to focus on developing a solution. The greatest thing about all of this is that we're stronger, we're mightier, we're better than ever. And the SWEB team has already been offered a new building to work out of the location TBD. And they say because their business operates in the cloud, they'll be back up and running by Monday. Reporting live south of downtown, Devin Clark, KSAT 12 News. Thank you, Devin. Nearly one year after a West Side boxing gym went up in flames, San Antonio firefighters are battling flames at the very same place today. The fire broke out at the Advocates Boxing Gym on Buena Vista. That's near South San Jacinto around 2 this afternoon. Firefighters tell us the flames were coming from a garage that was being used for storage. It's unclear what started the fire, but we're told it caused about $10,000 worth of damage. Arson is investigating. This is video from last March when part of the actual gym was destroyed in a fire. At that time, the owner told us they believe the fire had been intentionally set. It's unclear whether anyone was ever arrested. The gym, which works with at-risk kids in the area, was able to rebuild with the help of a $10,000 donation from Walmart and PepsiCo, along with donations from people in that community. Do you remember this man? We told you about him on Wednesday as a man that San Antonio police were looking for. And thanks to a tip from a viewer, he has now been arrested. 30 year old Christopher Alvarez accused of inappropriately touching a 13 year old at the Walmart at Southwest Loop 410 back on February 13th. Arrest documents state that the teen was in the aisle alone when Alvarez allegedly bumped into her from behind in an inappropriate manner. She told investigators she hid in the bathroom, and when she came out, Alvarez approached her again, asking if she wanted to hook up, at which point she said no and went to find her family. Police say that encounter was captured on surveillance camera. They released Alvarez's photo, and after receiving a tip, he was arrested. This is, uh, he is now charged with indecency of a child. In meantime, San Antonio police are looking for a man accused of shooting a subway worker this morning. Police say the victim found about eight this morning behind the counter of the subway on Roosevelt and 410. That's in the Espada North Shopping Center. According to police, the victim was the only person working at the time. It's unclear whether the shooting was the result of an attempted robbery or if the victim and the suspect know each other. Police hope surveillance video will lead them to the suspect. The number of confirmed cases of coronavirus in San Antonio now sits at 10. Two cases from the group of evacuees from Wuhan, China. Four people tested positive for the virus in Japan before they were brought to the U.S. Once that group was at Joint Base San Antonio Lackland, four others tested positive for the virus. Meantime, health officials in California are still trying to find out how a woman in Solano County contracted that virus through what's called community spread. 
As ABC's Alex Presha reports, the CDC admitting the after this afternoon that testing in that state for COVID-19 has, quote, not gone as smoothly as we would have liked. Today, a wake up call from the World Health Organization, raising the global risk assessment for COVID-19 to very high, but stopping short of calling it a pandemic. We do not see evidence as yet that the virus is spreading freely in communities. As long as that's the case, we still have a chance of containing this virus. This afternoon, the Solano County Public Health Administrator confirming to ABC News that the county has a new confirmed case of novel coronavirus. That person was under quarantine at Travis Air Force Base. They are asymptomatic and now at home in Solano County under self-quarantine. In California, authorities scouring this community to find out if COVID-19 could have spread. After a Solano County woman showed up to a local hospital with flu-like symptoms, she was placed onto a ventilator but was not tested for the virus until four days later. At this point, we don't know where the patient was exposed. On Capitol Hill, more questions following a whistleblower complaint that federal employees interacting with quarantine Americans at Travis and March Air Force bases allegedly worked without proper training or protective gear. There were several concerns that we had. Uh, the whistleblower issue uh, remains unresolved, at least for Travis Air Force Base and perhaps for others. Health and Human Services Secretary Alex Azar announced this afternoon they're going to be fast-tracking the process for broader testing in a large number of labs over the next few weeks. Bedside testing, though, is something that's still months away. Alex Brechet, ABC News, Washington. The coronavirus already has forced many to change, even put off their travel plans. And now with spring break about a week away for many college students, many of them are rethinking their plans about going abroad or even to the beach. Students at Trinity University have another week of classes before spring break, and they are watching where COVID-19 is spreading. Some told us they were planning trips out of state. Those that are flying say they do plan to take precautions like frequently washing their hands and trying to avoid close contact with anyone who's coughing or sneezing. Some are also thinking hard about joining the crowd at Padre Island as well. So I know how close in contact you are to everyone and you really don't know where they're coming from. So I actually have been thinking about like if I really want to go to the beach. Meantime, the administration at the University of the Incarnate Word is taking steps now to minimize student exposure. Today, it announced it is canceling a faculty-led student trip to Italy, the hardest-hit country in Europe. It, as well, is recommending students adhere to CDC policies when considering any travel on spring break. Uh, and here's a shot of the Alamo City with our live cam. Beautiful afternoon. And I like that we have those high thin cirrus clouds streaming overhead because that's going to make for a colorful and lovely sunset later on this evening. All right, it was a cold start to the day today. We did make it down into the 20s in a few communities. Pleasanton started your day at 29, 27 Hondo, 26 for the low in Kerrville. Here in San Antonio, we started at 37, but we rebounded nicely. That's the key. Take a look at our weather watchers, mostly in the 70s right now. An exception is Rock Springs at 69, 74 Bandera, 73 Maiko, Seguin at 74. Temperatures, yeah, they'll drop this evening, but not as cold as the past couple of nights. By 10 p.m., 54, midnight right at 50 degrees, so maybe long sleeves or a light jacket, but we're not talking about a freeze tomorrow morning. I'll help you prepare for the weekend and our next chance of rain coming up. Thank you, Adam. We're just a few days away from Super Tuesday. Today is the last day of early voting in the state of Texas. The polls open until 8 o'clock tonight, so you still have some time. As of last night, more than 95,000 people have voted in Bear County. The primary election is Tuesday, March 3rd. If you're unfamiliar with Super Tuesday, we want to help you understand what it is. Right now on KSAT.com, we explain how it got started, which states participate, and how it could impact this year's election. For all of our election coverage, you can go to KSAT.com slash vote 2020. The 2020 Democratic candidates are making their closing arguments to voters today on the eve of the South Carolina primary. Yeah, this race is still anybody's game, but whoever wins in South Carolina will likely have the most momentum going into Super Tuesday. And Daryl Fogues is in, La in Car South Carolina in Columbia. He's going to take a look at how candidates are making their final pitch. 
Yeah, that's right, Stephen Ursula. Good evening to the both of you. We're just under 24 hours away from the South Carolina primary, and the candidates are doing what they can to get those last minute votes. And we're talking about 54 delegates at stake. It's crunch time in Carolina. So let's get going. On the eve of the Palmetto State primary, the 2020 candidates are going all in. I've been down here more than any other candidate to meet people, to look them in the eye. Each pitching a common message, beating President Trump. That's how we're going to deliver the change that we need, a majority big enough not just to put an end to this presidency, but to put Trumpism into the history books. I'm Elizabeth Warren, and I'm the woman who is going to beat Donald Trump. No candidate has staked more on South Carolina than Joe Biden. I don't want to jinx myself along the line here. I feel very good. A big win here could give Biden the momentum needed to stop Bernie Sanders. Do you think running as a socialist would help you in, in uh, Georgia? Help you in North Carolina, help you in South Carolina, help you in Texas. But Sanders isn't lying down. We are building a movement that cannot be stopped. Hoping to improve after a nearly 50 point loss to Hillary Clinton in 2016's primary. He really adapted his campaign and yep. changed and learned from his loss. And I think that's made a significant difference here in the state. The candidates also need to An look ahead with Super Tuesday just four Great. days away. Hello, Sam. Thank you, North Carolina. When Michael Bloomberg finally appears on balance. The other candidates have just focused on four states, and I've trying been trying to run a national campaign. With 34% of all delegates up for grabs on one day, the stakes couldn't be any higher. Now, Stephen Ursula, many of the candidates after tonight will move on to several other states and cities like San Antonio to focus on Super Tuesday. We're live in Columbia, South Carolina. I'm Daryl Forges. Guys, back to you. We're getting ready here in San Antonio. Thank you, Daryl Forges in Columbia. We are learning more about five people killed in a workplace shooting rampage in Wisconsin. Now, the victims have been identified as 60-year-old Dale Hudson, 33-year-old Jesus Valle, 61-year-old Jenity Levchez, and 33-year-old Trevor Wetzelar and 57-year-old Dana Walk. All five were fatally shot by a co-worker on Wednesday at the Molson Coors Complex in Milwaukee. The gunman, 51-year-old Anthony Farrell, also found dead. Police say he turned the gun on himself. They are still, though, investigating the motive.